Yeah, it was it was excellent. Um, uh, the, yeah, the live stream is going, and I don't have my volume muted. All right, that's better now. Um, I mean, because yeah, basically, I I saw the press release, and then I forwarded it over to Willie, and I'm like, set, set him up an interview. Let's let's get these guys on. Cool. I did that last time we were recording uh, Chainsaw Buffet on the. Uh... On you stream, I left the little because I'm basically pulling through stereo mix into pulling from you know stereo mix through Skype into both you stream and Audacity. So uh, I left the uh, listen to your you know listen to what's being played. Yeah. So everything had reverb on it, but you know no one on Skype had a clue because working fine. It, were you at least bringing it in on separate tracks so you could like kill some of it or no? No, all I had to do was mute it in the Ustream producer but it, it was just funny because we kept getting that in chat. Like, oh, that's that's what that is. Ustream producer doesn't make that obvious. Well, now, um, Mad Ninja, you're going to have to give me the the context here. I need the, I need the motivation um what 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 is my goal what is my what is my uh character feeling when they deliver that line wait 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 we require why do why is this a requirement i i i Did I you don't guys know. make a deal or something like is there they it, it's probably gonna wind up in a dubstep song that's um, and that's fine i mean <laughs> eventually everything ends up in a dubstep song. I'm waiting for a chat notification. Are you, are you getting chat? Yeah, they just stop at the... Uh... All I saw was Stegs and uh, Mad Ninja Skills saying amp, 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 amp. Oh. Now, so you got Dylan saying it. Is amp, amp, amp the new wub, wub, wub? <laughs> uh. Oh, we got a, we got a link. We're going to click a link from chat and... <clears throat> oh man, that's like a... That's like this huge chat log. Yeah, that's going to take a while to parse. All right. TLDR. You got the recorder ready? Oh. You got, the, you, you got all, all devices on? I'll give you an amp, amp, amp. Amp, amp, amp. Amp. Amp, amp. Amp, amp, amp. <laughs> oh. MTMB Studios. Sell me middleware, baby. Yeah, I think I think we should kick off uh, kick off our sunburn. Get get rolling here on the show. Uh, Cicely will join us shortly. Yes. Yeah. Jasmine feeding time. Uh, all right. We're gonna go with uh, collision. I think I'm just gonna have to set you up and let you. That's cool. All right. Hey, Dylan. Hey, Mike. Hey, Dylan. I heard you hit another wall. Well, yes, and that's exactly uh, what I wanted to happen. Because you want to know when you hit the wall versus when you hit the, the floor. floor. Yes. See, what we're talking about is collision detection with the Sunburn gaming engine. So the example that I, I was talking about that, that I'd done for the last couple of, of these spots that we did, um, you know, I got to the point where I could move a character around and then, you know, run into walls and stuff like that. Uh, Sunburn handles all that collision under the hood. You just flag the, uh, the object as... Um, you know, having some sort of collision detection that handles it for you. Now, that becomes a problem, you know, that becomes a problem if you want to allow the player to jump because then you don't know when it's gravity pulling you onto the floor or you hitting the wall, and you don't want to allow the character to jump again in midair. So, well, unless you want the double jump. Unless you want the double jump. But technically, if you detected, you know, if you didn't have any limitations that could turn into triple quadruple and 
then you're just getting silly. Well, maybe this is an area that needs to be explored. Because let's be honest, when you when you jump, the first thing you test in the game is, can I double jump? Well, yeah, but if there's no limit on to how many times you could jump, then I'm that's just, just bad coding masquerading. I'm, I'm, as I'm a just game saying feature. I am not for government regulated jumping limitations. Maybe we just need to get the government out of our A button and just let as many jumps Are as you want. You're one of those jumpertarians. I'm a jumpertarian. Okay. They, but anyway, um, so when you're in the air and you're coming back down because you can no longer jump again. So anyway, you can um, add an event to uh, your your object that will fire whenever you collide with another object. And what this does is it's going to give you um, the object it collided with. It's going to give you the point where the collision actually happened. And through all this, you can actually get the normal of the surface it collided with. So then you can figure out if the normal is mostly pointing up you know, then we've hit a... A surface to stand on. A surface to stand on. We can jump again. Now, I don't know if that's um, exactly the whole algorithm that you want to use for figuring out where, where a character should start and jump. Start and jump. But the, the key is that you didn't do any collision detection pretty much on your own. You just... Right. You get set up, you set the flag, you hook in the event... Yeah. And then you know a collision has happened with this object. Yeah. And and I could also pull in information like say the collision is a bullet, you know, I can detect what that bullet is colliding with and then I can apply the bullet's damage to that other object. So There you go. There you go. So, you know, some of us enjoy building all of our code from scratch and for the rest of us there is the Sunburn Gaming Engine. You just came up with a uh, tagline. I, I'm trying it out. We'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm testing it out there. Uh, you, you can get the Sunburn Gaming Engine over at SynapseGaming.com. Save that tagline for a week where we don't have anything to talk about, like planned to talk. We'll just, like, we'll just go taglines. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We can do jazz hands. It won't work unless, you know. I can't they're start the show. You, 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 I got, you're going to have to let me start the show. Okay. See, I had a good... Uh, hold on. I'm going to collect hands. myself. I'm going to pull it back together. I had a great opening. It was ruined. The moment was gone. Hold on. We did a good, good long spot. No, no. See, you're, you're, we you're are doing it again. Quality. You're doing it again. Trying to start the show. All right. Hello again, all my friends. Let's talk about some Xbox Indie games. That, that sounded so much better before it, it got trashed. Um, <laughs> enough I don't think of we can us. Ever tell. Um, let's talk to uh, Guillaume. Are you there still? We didn't lose you. Yeah, I'm there. Hello. All right, uh, Guillaume, and I'm 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 going to say his name bad throughout the night. So go ahead and, and please correct me so everybody can understand. All right. My name is Guillaume Boucher-Vida. Guillaume. Yes. I, I, I've written that down and I will attempt to stick to that. But you are um, the designer and marketer and, and other kind of uh, lead at Nine Dot Studio, correct? Did I get all that right? Yes, that's correct. All right. And a couple last week? Maybe not even a week ago, uh, a little uh, bit more than a week ago. I think you, you sent out a press release on brand, and yes. I, I gotta say, when I saw that, this did not look like an indie game. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. this this looked quite amazing, and I was like, let's get these guys on and and let's let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so before the show, I was asking you guys uh, what the makeup of the team was. And what the experience is. So it's not just you; it's a, it's a team coming at it. So uh, who's all the people that make up Nine Dot Studio? Well, I have two models and one animator. There's myself as a designer and marketer and manager, and I have, of course, a programmer. And pretty much, like nobody in the team had much experience in the game industry. There was just my programmer who worked on maybe one or two projects. And aside from that, we're all juniors. So, and, and when you say juniors too, you also you said um, that you guys are, are right out of uh, uh, high school or college? College. Okay, so, you, so you're and kind of right out of college. 
there's one person who's out of university. Okay. Um, is that the, that the same thing as United States College University? I think so. I think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you guys are all young in it, and I mean, the, the, if, if nobody's watched, uh, if you're just listening to the audio of the podcast on the show notes, uh, there's a link to the trailer, and, and go watch the trailer. So it looks like it's this um, Metroidvania style game. Um, I, side yeah, scroller, but it's like, 3D. Well, so well, how much how much of it is 3D? It looks like it's more of like a, a Shadow Complex style 3D. Yeah, that's that's what yeah, I mean. exactly. The, it, the game is all in 3D visually, but the gameplay is completely in 2D. Uh, so some some questions in the chat. The, the name of the game is Brand. Um, yeah. It's going to be a hard thing probably to Google um, when you look up. So make sure you know you search on uh, Brand Xbox Live Indie Games or just just at GameMarks.com. You know. And, and click an ad or two while you're there. Um, so the the game, though, uh, from the press release, like it is actually going to be a Metroidvania style game, right? It's going to be a free exploration type. Well, it's it's some kind of a bastard child between Mega Man and Castlevania, because just like in Mega Man, you choose in which level you want to go. Uh, unlike, say, Castlevania or Metroid, where there is just one big map. It's mm-hmm. more of three smaller maps that you can freely go uh, from one to another to choose which upgrades you want to get. Okay, all right. So working back and forth. What? Um, so you guys are new at it. Did you guys build everything behind it, or uh, what? What did you use? Did you did you use anything uh, in that, or is it all just straight uh, X and A? Everything is made from scratch from X and A. Uh, we tried to get an engine at first, and we hadn't heard about uh, Synapse Gaming Sunburn. We were just not sure what to get, and my programmer was feeling confident that he could pull it off since it was in 2D, so gameplay is relatively simple. Okay. So, um, and you obviously, you said you had two 3D artists, right? Yes. On, on, on the staff. And had they had experience prior to in, in doing 3D models? Well, only from school. Uh, one of them was out from the ENDE in Quebec, which stands for École Nationale du Divertissement Interactif, which is pretty much like uh, a simulation of business in video games, and you they had a full project to develop. So that's pretty much what the, their experience was. Yeah, so Stegs is, is, is hitting in on... Uh... Castlevania being applied to every 2D game. I actually kind of have a gripe with the term Metroidvania. Because yeah. what did what did Castlevania do to get in that? I mean, it copied from Metroid. So, But why does it get chained in there? Because like the first Castlevanias were, were just scrolling platformers. Yeah, like there was no freedom of exploration. And it wasn't until like, what, the Game Boy, I think, that they actually started... Well, no, um... Metro, or uh, Metroid 2. Uh, Castlevania 2 was actually kind of an adventure game, and you had to run around the world and go different places. Yeah, the, but it was still um, linear, like in in the way that you you went back and forth in in Castlevania. I mean, it was no more or less. It was not a because usually when people say Metroidvania, right, they imply that it's free roaming, and that there are like, stuff like that. Um, upgrades that you can get to then go unlock an area like you couldn't get to before. Um, you know, Shadow Complex is very much the same way, where you, you have to go get a certain gun um, or ability before you can jump high enough to get over this wall to get to the new area. So, I mean, you are kind of on a path merely by the restrictions of your character, right? So until yeah. you get, like, in Metroid, until you get the missiles, you can't open the red doors. So they can kind of guide you around a little bit. Um, until you get the bomb, you know, when you're small, you can't go down in a couple places. No, I think Castlevania 2 did that. Now, Castlevania 2 is the one that sticks out in my mind because it's the one I actually, like, played. Actually played. I don't even think I played Castlevania 1. I mean, I Castlevania, Castlevania 2, 3. really, you could get the holy water and you break upgrade some bricks, your whip. You could... but... No, I think there were places you had to... You... There wasn't a lot of that, but there was a little bit of it, where you had to have a certain item. And then in Castlevania Three, it kind of just went back the other way. Yeah. Like, they danced at it and they went away, and it's not until, like, the Game Boy Castlevania's that Castlevania they really got... Castlevania Two is, like, the 
the equivalent of Zelda 2 almost. It, it's almost like, like I wouldn't... Hey, we're doing this other thing, now we're done. It's almost <laughs> like a, a Super Mario Brothers 2 where like you'll find out like... There you go. It wasn't actually supposed to be a Castlevania game. You know, we just didn't think you dumb Americans could handle it, so... You just put you know the name on there and, and pass it off, but the real Castlevania too. So it's like much more so awesome. much of of what's called Metroidvania is like all in Metroid, and like it's like yes, Castlevania had some Metroid elements, but that just makes it a Metroid game. That doesn't make the genre Metroidvania. Well, it's saying... not the same thing as uh, you know. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I I mean, the MMO genre is also called pretty much every time a WoW clone it's all about what makes uh, what defines a genre more than what started it true true um, so yeah and, and it, it could be it could be an age thing too right because I yeah. mean it could be because I you know where I came at like I saw Metroid do this thing and then years later I saw Castlevania jump in to that area and so to me it was like well I mean they're not bad games, but it's like Metroid kind of defined that to me. But if you're SNES, I mean, if you're like, you know, you, you, you got into gaming uh, Super Nintendo era, right? Like, we have this problem with Legend of Zelda. Legend of Zelda to you is completely different to Legend of Zelda to me because... No, no, I, I, did, play, I did play the first and second Zelda games uh, on, on Nintendo, but I played Super Nintendo, so that's the one like that that was that kind was of the, the pinnacle. iconical like, yeah the iconic uh and I've never finished it that was Zelda perfected <laughs> and then it's all downhill <laughs> from there uh. oh so um any anyway that that's getting off uh, uh oh no I, I lost the email yeah we we start an interview and then we start arguing about some yeah yeah I got off track and I had I had the email up uh with 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 notes on 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 brand. So how long have you been in development with brand? It's been almost six months now, and we still have about a couple of weeks before being done with development, and then we will be really more about debugging and tweaking. You going to go to uh, play test with it on the uh, XNA forums? Uh, I think I will, but I'm not sure if I will have enough time. Oh, do you have like a a, a date you're trying to hit or? We we can't promise anything, but we're trying to be out by September nineteenth, or at least during that week. Is there is there something special on that week, or is that just a your target? Uh, it was target, and it's also that we we can't like keep always pushing back the, the date because there are there is a, a contest. It's I think it's called Indie Game Challenge, and it requires to send them a copy of the game for October 3, so we just wanted to have some buffer. Ah. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah, so making that. But no, it's good to have a date. I mean, we, we've had to do that um, for the games that we've made, or the game, game. yeah. Well, I mean, it forces we, we need you... to do that on the other games, because, like, I've already started another project, and, <laughs> like, we didn't finish the two projects prior to that. and It forces you to lock yourself into a certain feature set instead of going... Oh, hey! It would be cool if we added this, and you know. But we've actually made more progress on this particular. St- <laughs> so, um, besides the gameplay, what's kind of the story uh, that you've got going in brand? Well, I'll be very honest. The story isn't that big. It's more about creating a universe and adding like some lore. But the game in itself isn't much. It's just you're given a sword. You're a you're a no name, and you're just asked to make the sword fit for a king. That ends it. The story is much more what the player makes of it, how he builds up his sword and wh- what he tries to get, how, in which order. That is the story, really, of the game. Okay, all right. Um, any voice acting going to be in the game? Uh, no, there won't be any. No? Okay. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think. think I, I lost the, the network on the email that I had up of your press release, unfortunately. Um <laughs> Anything save me? Anything you want to bring up on the game? Um, I think the main aspect of the game is that it's going to be exactly what I think is the value behind a $3 game. It will be short, maybe a couple of hours, maybe like three, four hours, but there will be plenty of reasons to play it all over again. 
that's really the main, the core aspect of the game. The fact that you can play it the way you want. Just like, I don't know, in Diablo 2, you could do many different builds and you could try them all out. And I want to capture that aspect of the game. All right, you've mentioned you've mentioned quite a uh, a few games. You've been playing games for a while. Uh, what, what are what are your, some of your iconic Touchstone games that uh, you feel you know like these are like the influential games that I played? Yeah, um, let's see. I play a lot of games. I I I never stop playing. I try a little bit of everything. I'm not exactly a retro gamer. I, I'm. I'm an hardcore gamer that plays pretty much everything I can find. So it's hard for me to pinpoint like 10 games that are more influential than others. But in the case of brand, I can tell that my influences that were the most strong were Mega Man and uh, every other very challenging games and build games like, like I stated, Diablo or any pretty much any RPGs. But aside from that, games that I preferred were... Uh, stuff like Legion of Mana, because it's like the the most, uh, how could I say? It's the games that gives you the most freedom and artistic expressions as a gamer, as a player. Uh, aside from that, I'm, of course, a big fan of Final Fantasy VII. I love fighting games such as Kieran Stank, Dead or Alive. So it's hard for me to pinpoint like one game that I put above everything else. <clears throat> Okay, all right. So uh, when you play games, do you find you're, you're uh, um, a guy that has to get the thousand achievement points, or do you pretty much, I played it, and I, that's fine, I'm here for the game? I'm definitely an achievement whore. It's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's a term I would use, but I wasn't going to, like, say it to you. Uh, that sounds so derogatory. It is derogatory. It is. You know, I, I had to do it. I had to do it as uh, Assassin's Creed. To um, finish that up, and you know, usually I can say no, but sometimes when you're like, <laughs> you've got 800 points of the thousand, and you kind of look down the list, and there's like two you can just knock out, you know, you just got to go kill a bunch of guards at once or something, then all of a sudden you find yourself collecting a hundred feathers throughout the map because you know, two achievements, and you can say you got them all. The first yeah, step and... is admitting you have a problem. <laughs> no, I have a problem. <laughs> Sorry, I cut you off there. Yeah, go well, ahead, go me. It really gets to you when you have only just a few achievements to get, and you know that it won't just be the game that you have every achievement. It will really appear as the game you completed, and it just like making a statement. That game, I owned it. Yes. Uh, now, my, my personal low point, though, was Mass Effect 1, um, the DLC. Oh gosh, don't tell me about it. I never got a final one. Just was so frustrating and was shouting on my screen for hours. Like that last one, it was just shooting. Like that's the worst thing that Mass Effect did. And yes. you had to like run around and shoot a number of, of guys inside of like a certain time limit. And like Mass Effect is not a good first person shooter. It got better in two, but uh, one was not. And like the only thing, the only reason I got that DLC. Is because when that DLC came out, all of a sudden I didn't have all the achievement points in Mass Effect. You know, <laughs> like that was, that was the only reason. You know, it was like I didn't even remember what was going on in Mass Effect to even like have the need to go back to the universe um, and and wrap up the story. It was just like, hey, go here. And in fact, it was like a training mission or something. Like the DLC told you it was like. I remember seeing you play that one because you were. I don't know. I think it was over. You were playing it before when I came over before we were going to record something or work on something. I was probably like, quite pissed off. Yeah, I remember <laughs> seeing you go through it like two or three times. Well, uh, the thing is, when I did that DLC, I was playing a character that is the engineer class. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty much impossible for me. All I had as a weapon was a pistol. It just didn't cut it. And I'm usually very persistent with my achievements. Uh, I mean, I completed Mega Man 9 without dying. And I couldn't complete that achievement on Mass Effect. I tip my hat to you, sir. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a whole podcast of me swearing at Mega Man 9. <laughs> like, I I don't think I've gone back to Capcom since Mega Man 9. Like, I was like... Because, like, Mega Man 9 is not... 
like so Mega Man like one, two, and 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 three, right? They're hard, but they're well designed, right? And Mega Man Nine just does all these things to you of like, you just didn't see this screen coming up, so we're just gonna ha ha, you died, start over, you know? And I just felt they were like cheap with it. They weren't like. If hard is good, then impossible is better because we go to 11. Well, it was like a block pattern, you know, like so you'd be jumping on the block pattern and then like it, they're hard enough to land on their own as they are. Yeah. In Mega Man 1 and 2 and 3, you, you'd kind of like expect where the next one would go or right. you saw the entire screen at once to know what the pattern was. Or you had Nintendo gonna... Power, which had the little numbered. Or you patterns. had Nintendo Power. That's... But in 9, like. It just like the the block path doubles back on itself at a moment, and it's like there right when you those, don't expect it. There were some of those in the earlier Mega Man games, but like that's what I'm saying, like, like you're in the area where you could see it all at once, so you can kind of like know that's coming. What I'm saying is like oh, you were side scrolling, so you can't see the other blocks as they appear. You had to like cross a chasm. I remember this. This is about the point where I just like I was like, no, I just I'd gone through like three different levels. Um, I had having to exit each of these levels back out. Um, yeah, I think I played the demo and like, no, I'm I'm not that kind of gamer anymore. So. <laughs> that is don't an, need the stress. That no. is an achievement. <laughs> that is it, an ulcer that I do not wish to have. Yes, but that he, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm my hats off to you, sir, for for doing that without dying. That's the entire game without a death. Yeah, well, I did all the achievements, and I can tell you that it was worse than that, like <laughs> completing the game without killing enemies or without using special weapons. Oh. Wow. <laughs> That's... No. Loads of fun. Oh, also completing the game five times in a day is pretty original. <laughs> Are you going to put any... Um, uh, usually they get called like awardments Award or something in, in your indie game? I would like to. Uh, I'll see if um, if we have time. It's pretty much in the wish list right now. But we will see what people ask for once the game is released because we really intend to support it post-release. Okay. The um, the awardment I've seen in a lot more games lately uh, in indie games coming yeah. on. And uh, uh, I don't know. I guess I, I kind of see... Like the first time when I saw them because they weren't gamer score, I just passed over them. But now that I'm seeing them more often, uh, I'm kind of curious. You know, it's like, oh yeah, maybe I'll, I'll get these. But I think if you're gonna do that in your indie game, um, it needs to kind of unlock something or do something in the game. Like yeah, if you get them all like in the game, show them off. yeah, you can't right. show them off, and they're not anywhere else. So it's like, yeah, I got all of them, and I, you know, unlocked concept art, or I unlocked a little video, or I unlocked a new level, or something that, you know, a little bonus. Uh, I think that that would be cool, and you know, give some replayability to some of the games. Not that they have to do that, though. I mean, yeah. it's definitely we not. will ex- we'll explore the possibility, but. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure that's the kind of stuff we we will insist on, simply because we are kind of uh, eager to start on the next project. So we will release it post project, but really for the the features that we already planned and awardments. Although the fun, we we can't really um, how to say. Well, and I mean, you have a much better first game than we did, but there's a lot. To like actually, you know, you get it out there and you you, you ship it and you you learn a lot about the process. That it's almost like yeah. don't don't overbuild your first game with all these yeah, ideas exactly. because you know you, you you haven't gone through it yet. And um, well, you're looking to create that one, you know, this one, you know, just absolutely perfect polished game, and you realize, you know, it it's going to do what it's going to do you know, when it hits the marketplace and you do need to be thinking ahead because, you know, there's only so much you can do with one game. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. And, and the thing is, brand in itself is really just a pilot project. We think we have a very cool product. I think it's representative of what Nine Dots will be about. But I just wanted to have something uh, to to show to maybe investors and banks and tell them, Look, we've completed a project. We we are solid. We are real, and we're we're getting press uh, coverage and whatever. So, 
just to make sure we can then ask for money and maybe start the real game, start having a salary, not be entirely dependent on the sales because right now the whole team is without salary. And of course, it's very tough on the moral and there are always a stress, especially for me, the, will they get a job offer? Will, will they leave 9.studio? And once I can't pay them, that whole stress goes away and that will be of like a tremendous help on my right. <clears throat> mental sanity. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, you know, I'm really impressed by hearing you talk. I mean, for, like, first game for you guys, first studio, and, you know, to have... Because usually, when I encounter, like, the first one, it's like, well, I have this killer idea, and it's going to be Minecraft, and it's going to be, you know, awesome. And, and nobody looks behind, like, Notch and realizes, like, how many games he did... Before yeah. he did Minecraft, you know, and mm. it's like there's a lot of 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 learning and, and building up, and 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 that's exactly you know we've said this several times on the podcast. That's that's the strength of Xbox Live Indie Games, that you know it's on the Xbox, it's on on a marketplace, um, that you know it it shows that you can ship a game on on you know the modern on console real, yeah. console hardware. Uh, you know, it, it's not a huge market, so you know you can't really expect. Um, crazy revenue off of it, mm-hmm. but I mean, there's tons of tales of. In fact, uh, one of the news stories I queued up, um, Z Boyd, there, Robert Boyd, uh, Z Boyd Games. They, you know, they did uh, Breath of Death and Cthulhu Saves the World. Um, yeah. it, it's funny. I heard him talk recently, or maybe I read an article or heard him talk, and and he said, you know, like my first game was. Uh, Breath of Death, and then we did Cthulhu Saves the World, and you know that took off. And I was like, "No, wasn't your first game uh, Epiphany in Space, followed by Molly the Wears? Are we just rewriting those? Are we just gonna sweep those under the carpet? Those aren't real games because <laughs> they know, were text they adventures on a console. Um, but uh, apparently, now this is still—I didn't get anything to confirm this at the time we're recording this podcast. But from the swag. Uh, going in the bags at PAX and from like some of the signage up, it looks like that Z-Boyd Games is going to do the third Penny Arcade game. That's kind of crazy. Now, have they been getting different studios to do those up to this point? Well, um, I think when they did the first Penny Arcade game, they had um, the uh, Telltale Game guys yeah, do that. I, I remember I actually played a little bit of yeah, that. Yeah, because it was on the... the, the with the, XBLA. It was an XBLA title. Um, and then I think there was a follow-up to that XBLA title done, but I, I think like the, the the sales were not great on it. And, you know, it was kind of tailoring off and maybe, you know, it's not interested. Or, you know, they're, and they're also the Penny Arcade guys, so maybe they wanted to go to an indie gamer. So I don't know how much of this... I'm speculating. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering... Some of this might have been like, hey... Telltale, we we have games that are bringing in money, so we're okay. We don't need the Penny Arcade license. Thank you very much. Thank you for the offer. Um, you know, for yeah, I wonder if games. it was a business issue or if it was just like, hey, let's move around. You know, kind of mix up what. Well, because it does kind of seem like a thing. Like if it was taking off, like yeah. If and I may not have been Telltale, but uh, it was in definitely an adventure game uh, group. They would have probably been like, no, no, we're doing the next one and doing the next one, and we're, you know, we're all happy yeah. and everybody loves everything and come in here, have a cigar, you know. Um, <laughs> oh. But it, it definitely seems more like, a, oh no, no, we're good, take it, no, no, no bad feelings at all. Here you go. Do um, you want me to mail that to you on a CD? All the code to you, you know, like that's that was kind of the vibe. But I mean, the, the reason you know I had that queued up and all that is like that's amazing for Z Boy Games. I mean that's a pretty big get. Yeah. Um, and that's and the interesting thing too is if you look at at the two games they've done like Cthulhu Saves the World and uh, Breath of Death like are they going to go that direction are they going to go like you know classic RPG style or you know is this going to be like a bigger well it appears project? so um, there'll be a link in the show notes but essentially the card that was in there um, had Gabe and uh, Tycho Tycho as Little eight bit eight bit Robert Boyd style art guys um, standing in front of a three, and then at the very bottom it says Z Boyd Games. 
so it looks very retro um, right. the, the design so I mean is it gonna play as a role-playing game possibly I mean I, mean, I, I would say but not guaranteed but it definitely looks like like the 8-bit style I think that from what I played of the first penny arcade game I think that would definitely fit the style of um, kind of what they do because the original penny arcade game was not you know, Gabe and Tycho as Gabe and Tycho. It was basically they were put into this other sort of world, as I remember, like these different roles. Like I don't even think it was like a modern setting. I it's been so long since I played it. But I've, I mean, there's two I, episodes apparently were put out by Hothead Games. Oh, okay. Is that oh, what Stegs okay. is going off about? I just glanced over and Stegs is, is yelling at me oh, again. Oh, I'm not looking at that. I went to the wiki. You're oh, wrong, you went to the wrong. wiki. Stegs is saying something like, you know, oh, now you look over at chat. You know, like, you can't remember the name, but, you know, it's like, um... um but, I mean, <laughs> that that would fit that, you know, they get thrown into something completely, you know, crazy. Kind of like Cthulhu Saves the World, you know. It's this, you know... So, um... World. All right, let's see. The other, the other news, since we kind of moved into news here. Um, Radiant Games. So, uh, I don't know if, uh, Guillaume, you, you saw... Uh, yeah, I saw their games. Their games, where they raised all their prices to $5. Um, so, essentially, uh, Luke... Uh, of Radiant Games, when he was kind of leaving, you know, he's he's going to iOS and and focusing on uh, iOS platform for his next games. Yes. Announced that like in a few weeks, you know, or in a week or whatever, he's going to raise the price of all of his games to five dollars. So all his one dollar games are all going to go to five dollar games. So he mm-hmm. posted a blog post to say how that went, and. He's basically said the game sold 700 to 800 more units than they would have otherwise, leading up to the price hike. Right, so people bought it early. So basically okay. there's a lot of people who liked his stuff or, or liked his games, and he got them, they go back in and they went and they bought the rest of them. I remember or, seeing that on Twitter, like a bunch of people in the community were saying, hey, make sure you buy these. Now, he posted some numbers here since he's gone to $5 for all his games. Yeah. Um, none of his games made top downloads, for, even from the increased activity on buying. Uh, so none of them hit any new lists. So there was no marketing exposure right. gain. Um, but he has a list, basically, of the conversion rate that they had at $1. And they vary from 20% to 45%, depending on the game. And then at, at the five dollar range, the conversion rate is five percent to a max of fifteen percent. So a huge ding in conversion rate. But of course, yeah, it's one dollar versus five dollar game. And, so. and it's a it's a dual stick shooter, so you can probably get. He you know. created a um, effective conversion rate, and the effective conversion rates are all about one and a half times greater than. They were at a dollar so, because the five dollars coming in. Right. If if you have basically if you have one dollar, he's basically timed the conversion rate of the five dollars uh, times five because that's worth selling five one dollar games. But the only piece of the puzzle that he doesn't have info on um, is are the games going to hold up enough downloads at the five dollar rate to make the gain in conversion rate worth it? Well, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, so he he uh, leaves you with a big question mark at the end and doesn't answer. What will be the conversion rate after it's at $5? Yeah, That's so all he has, I mean, he has on there the conversion rate after it went to $5, but this is the recent change, right? So this isn't the, it's been at $5 for a while now, and did it fall back below the downloads? So essentially, the conversion rates are better. All right. The effective conversion rate is better. The actual conversion rate is worse, okay? But okay. the effective amount is better. But the question is going to be will the $5 price tag affect the total downloads? Yeah. Well, he's not you said he's not on top downloads. He's he's basically depending on his top ratings and and yes. name yes. recognition. So it could work for him whether, you know, in yeah, this it, particular Yeah, it could. It could. Situation. If he can keep 
if it keeps the uh, the same number of downloads that he was seeing, then the the conversion rate works in his favor. Actually, the price yeah. change and the lower conversion rate ends up in his favor. But if people see a five dollar game and then don't even bother to try it anymore, then you know that's going to hurt. Yeah. And five dollars has kind of become a it's a rare price point to see that even it's for very well. And I think the the one of the things um, the dangers in the price point isn't necessarily the consumer, yeah, and what they're willing to buy and what they're willing to pay. It's how the lists are structured and that the top downloads list, you know, isn't giving five times the credit for one sale. Um, you know, it's 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 much easier to get on those top lists as a one dollar game and move a lot of units. And it almost becomes like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy because now that you're on the top download list, you get more exposure, you get more sales, um, even if your game generated more revenue. Fortress Craft, of course, being the exception. You know, the exception. If, you, if you clone Minecraft, then you get to slide up to the top. I don't know. There, there are too many variables, I think, to say, you know, this is what you should do in any given case. But hey, Well, I think... Like I think you can aim at simply being at the top rated if you can be in the top downloaded. One of the games are like they're being downloaded, of course, but that doesn't make them necessarily well rated. I think of games like uh, How Long Can You Hold Your Fart or something stupid like that. <laughs> it's in the top downloaded because it's cheap, it's stupid, but in the ratings, it's drastically lower than pretty much anything else you can find. Right. Yeah. Top downloads and top sales are two different concepts, but you know we only have one of those lists. The um, the thing with the rating too is uh, to really pump your fan base. Like, as you guys have your Facebook page and you know you're, you're getting out and you're building marketing to to let them know. Like, as soon as the game is out, you know, even if rate you don't it. buy it day one, please go rate us. Please go rate us because a lot of the ratings too are psychological. Like, if you come in and you see that rating ahead of time. And if the game's already rated a 3, even though there's only 10 votes, you're less likely to give it a 5, right? Because, you know, it's like a 3, I like it, I'll give it a 4. If you come in and you see a game as a 4, you know, 4.5, and you're going to give it like a 4, 4.5, 5, you know? Like, it, yeah. it, there's a there's a snowball effect to the ratings, so it's in your it's in your best interest to get the fans to stack that in your deck, you know? Like... Launch me with a good rating, um, because that way we can stick to the top rated list, and then it, again, self-fulfills. Because um, I've seen a lot of games that are underrated. You know, you, you go in there, and, you, and you're like, why is this a 3? You know, like, this is definitely like a 4 or a 5. Uh, of course, there's been rating shenanigans in the history of Xbox Live, so that that's, yeah. that's hurt, you know, some yeah. of the older games. Um, but and then even like last it's harder year... to rate now. Even like last year when we went back and rated or uh, reviewed the the top rated games on the list, and I think this was before um, some of the ratings um, shenanigans actually broke. Whether they were actually happening or not, we don't know. But I mean, if you look at those, those are all over the list. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, they're, there were a couple of passes, about now, there were and, and, a whole and lot of tries. Been, it's it's unfortunate that that's happened. Um, indie gamer chick was in the chat, basically, you know, saying that the it sh the rating should be abolished, and, that, and that's because I remember what it was like before that, and it's like, no, we don't want that again, because then you only have top downloads, you know, it's kind yeah. of like the filter. Actually, the, make it easier, like like you make said, make it before, easier to rate, easier. and I would like to see like the ability to punch in comments. I mean, because you know, when you go to your iPhone, you go to your Android, you go to your mobile device. You don't look at the rating so much as you look at the rating and read the comment. There was an XKCD uh, comic about this not long ago. The uh, Tornado uh, app. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, this is why uh, ratings don't work. Don't you work. Know, four, st four stars. Uh, UI was nice and polished, you know. You know looks good. Looks you know, good. Looks nice. And Love then, like, it. one star did not tell me a tornado was nearby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Uh the thing that's a problem can be a serious problem, and and that's why I like the um, the the text, right? Because you're yeah. rolling down and you like read that one guy, and you're like, if that issue matters to you, like the actual ability to detect tornadoes with the tornado app. But I mean, if that's important to you, 
then that like kills the whole deal. Or like this guy got upset because it looks like an iPhone app on his Android. Like that doesn't bother me. There's a lot of iPhone app, iPhone looking apps uh, on Android because they use the same you know GUI framework. Yeah. I don't care that you gave it a two now, because to me like you're irrelevant. Like that's not important to me. It might be important to somebody else, but you lose all that in the aggregate. So I'd like to see the ratings expanded. Um, a little bit easier and letting people type in. Now, how many people will type in? I don't know. How many people have chat pads? Um, yeah, or how many people are going to go online? You don't need a whole lot of people to do it. You just need a couple of, Like, the people who comment are going to be the people who really liked it or really hated it. Well, well and then... Oh, go ahead. Go I'm on. thinking of a solution. It could be simply that you can't add comments if you're not part of the Xbox community. Uh, like on the app hub and have a creators club uh, license that's actually i mean that's not a bad idea it it locks out comments it locks out a lot comments for a lot of people who, who are probably going to be the audience but it does keep you from getting the crap that you will get from you know some of that stuff too though you know, i mean is kind of self-evident you, get the you know like we, oh. we've talked about this maybe maybe it's more apparent to us i don't know but like you know we when we have a developer commenting on a review as a means other than develop like they're using an alt and they're trying to act like they're not the developer like every one of those has stood out you know yeah. like those have stood out like a sort they of care time. way too much about little details if you do like an amazon said. system and then you can actually mark helpful not helpful to you know the ratings and then you come in you have like the most helpful comment and you have like ratings behind the raiders you know it's like oh this person yeah. gets all their comments marked you know helpful and then it's like you know xbox live xbla ratings.com has this so you can go look at somebody and when you look at their reviews you can see like their reviews were marked helpful or not to know like whether they're actually uh doing a decent job writing reviews so i think there's other you know don't don't throw it out because what makes an open marketplace like xbox live indie games work is a healthy rating and filter system yeah. When you get that right, then you have something crazy like iOS because you you know the best rise up and and when people release junk it quickly gets laughed and and goes to the bottom of the stack. What we have right now is a very broken implementation where some of the junk kind of like hangs around. It's um, very flat instead of very tiered between, yeah. you know, this is the good. And of course, like you said with the comments all that's subjective because a lot of the 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 top rated games when we reviewed them we gave some of them passes and tries and other people would be inclined to give those same um games buys depending well, on what they're looking for yeah like that there was some that we kind of wondered how they were in that top list yeah um but then again you know like in retrospect to what we've had to play the last month or so the last couple of months like how bad it's gotten like no those look great by you know Missile Escape, yeah, that's an excellent game. Um, oh. You know, uh, I went back. You realize we're we're over a year now. Like, yes, we the are. Game Marks is, is is over a year old. Um, I I went back and which means we've been doing this for a year and a half or more because we did a lot of video before we had the site up. Yeah. And like just went through like and we've, figuring we've done, out what we wanted yeah. to do and how it was going to look. I went back and I played some of our early trials. <laughs> it's and, painful. And, um, well, now keep in mind... I was so freaking mellow. The like, early trials were the games that we thought were either really interesting or really good. bad and we wanted to mock. No, 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 no. The early trials, we hadn't played the game at all. In the original well, yeah, trials, like, we had the game these was were sight things that unseen. We thought, we, we thought were going to stand out. Like, we did Breath of Death because, you know, that stood out. Whereas opposed to now, we're doing trials of new releases, and so... Yeah, I mean, I did. we did Breath of Death. Uh, I had you and Cicely do that one, simply because I knew it was a JRPG. JRPG. And I was like, alright, you guys need to check this out. We did Avatar Paintball because it sounded like a fun thing, and I went back and I watched it, and I was like, man... I would freaking rip this game like now. I think but... you're just tired of playing crap because because we come <laughs> having done this for a year, we come back to the same. You see the same problems over and over. You see the same themes come up again, like zombie games, you know. And you're just kind of like, I hate to say it, you're kind of jaded to it. Like, 
This well, is what I'm tired happens. of seeing like another is. like there was one this week of like. My it's gonna be first, good when we get back into game development. My <laughs> first dual stick shooter, like the first thing the guy makes, is a dual stick shooter and puts it up, and it does nothing decent. And you know, it's just like, yeah, it's it's the dual stick shooter controls. Got it. You, there's a bunch of these on the service, way better than what you've offered, and you haven't even come up with one original idea. Well, those don't seem to be the ones that you go off on. The, the ones you, you seem well, to go off Well, because we don't even do on, video of those. Yeah. Those we don't even acknowledge. The ones you seem to go off on are the ones that... Break I title mean, safe and, and don't allow yeah, passing like controller. Have, no, I'm, I'm, I'm done, joking there. Like, when I go off on that, that's like a small complaint compared well, to, like, gameplay complaints. You know, they've, they've got what would seem to be a halfway decent game, and you could forgive these things... If you were just playing that one game, or if you were playing two or three trials a week, maybe, but when you're playing like every game that gets released on indie games, you see the same stuff again and again, and you know it becomes more clear. Nobody's and, learning. Nobody's learning anything. Yes, and you you're not the most tolerant person. <laughs> but I was. But you were. I go back and play Avatar Paintball Trial and go like, that's not Mike. Who is that? That guy is, you know. Maybe you didn't feel comfortable saying these things on, like, we have to be nice to people. Or, you know, <laughs> we don't want to be. That's how it was when he started out. We had to be nice or like, not we want say to be anything at all. Where people realize that's the joke. And now it's just like. Yeah, I'm, I'm I've been hit by too many bricks. <laughs> There's been too many silver dollar games. I hate the world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at that time, there was only like 10 silver dollar games. And like some of them were like blow, you know? It was like, oh, this is, this is interesting. And now I there wish... are... Yes, I wish ahead. there was some kind of, I don't know, like a golden star or something that could be given to some games just to make sure there is some... Some games that are that are really worth your time, and I know that top rated technically should be doing that, but it doesn't. So to be able to just browse a, a list of games that really are identified by either the community, maybe the gamers or whatever, maybe maybe yeah, a website that could be interesting. Like maybe in well, I mean, I mean, it's basically what Kotaku's favorites were supposed, supposed to be. be yeah, supposed. You know, like at least they change it. Well, it, it would be nice <laughs> if you could go back, like, if, if that was a section that had, like, here here's the past favorites in this genre, and, you know, you know, kind of keep the service open, but have this curated section. That, that just, yeah, like, we're going to pull up and, and feature these, I guess. Um, yeah. And, yeah, that's, this has been... I don't know, we've gone over and over what <laughs> Xbox Live Indie Games should do, so it's hard to... Um, well, speaking, we might see more uh, indie developers. There was an article up, uh, again, we'll have a link in show notes, on ours, uh, basically on a huge trend of professional developers going indie. Like, that's actually becoming a point where it's a it's a trend and, a, and an issue in uh, the AAA studios of... People leaving? Or... Yeah, like, it's, okay. like, that's always kind of been... Something that happens anyway in games, like a lot of people leave, they start a studio, and then the studio gets acquired, and they come back, then they leave again, because, you know... I think it's a matter of trust. A matter of what? Trust. Of trust. Of trust? Yeah, because, well, I mean, the big publishers are supposed to be the money. They are supposed to be the big pillars, and as soon as one game doesn't cut it, they just shut down the whole studios, they cost 250 jobs to people, they ruin families, and they just don't want to live that again. Yeah, and in, in, in the article they're even talking about, like, if you can go a little further, where um, you're working on a game, everybody loves it, the team loves it, the manager loves it, your studio is acquired, the new studio looks at it and just kills a game at six months from release that's been in development for two and a half years uh, because, you know, somebody. The main character can't be female. Well, the main character, well, <laughs> somebody in marketing doesn't think that that genre is going to work or something or, yeah. or that's going to, you know, that's, that's going to play out or, you know, we should do that. And then. You know, they either reappropriate the developers to other projects, or they let them go. And um, it's it's gotten worse. In in the article, it, it talks a little bit about the AAA studios have gotten a little worse because you know this kind of stuff always went on, but not to the frequency it's been going on lately. Um, well, I mean, you, you... unfortunately, it's like 
I hope a lot of these guys that are thinking the grass is greener, it's like, it's not, man. The the, the, the tales of the notches and, you know, all that um, are few and far between. They're not the average. Well, yeah. it's Man getting more platform. common. What? Sorry. It's getting more common. I mean, uh, before it just wasn't possible. You, you could just imagine it. But right now, you have digital distribution that makes everything much more... I, think I, I don't know. It's, really what has it. made it uh, attractive for indies um, is Steam. Steam. I think Steam yeah. is the one... It's probably the I, you know, I think iOS, true, places. but... I think what's attracting the AAA developers... I don't think iOS is attracting the AAA developers. And a couple of no, them are like, hey, I can go do Angry Birds. Most yeah. of them don't want to do Angry Birds. That's why they're at the studio. Because well, it's, it's a shift from, from what they do. Yeah, they, they don't do want to do Facebook really games. High, they don't want to do casual games. Really highly polished. Steam lets you do hardcore gamer games and gives you a digital distribution platform that you can, as an indie game developer, do really well. Yeah. Um, I think... You know, Microsoft could have that on their platform, but I think Microsoft is still too tied up in the old guard. And, you know, oh, it's yeah. like, that's a dangerous boat to rock. They came out and almost said in an interview, um, I, I, I should have got this pulled up, but I didn't have it uh, pulled up. But there was an interview. Um, oh, no, no, I did. I do got this pulled up. Uh, it's it basically. If you publish on PlayStation Network, right? If you publish on another platform first, if you publish on Steam, they don't want you for Xbox Live Arcade. Microsoft yeah. basically came out and said, and I'm surprised they said this. Like, this is something you know, but you just don't come out and say. But they basically said, like, yeah, if you publish on PlayStation first, if, you, if you're game there, then there's no chance it's going to come on to uh, Xbox. We're going to hold that above uh, you know the developers and say like no you gotta come to us first and give us exclusive if you wanna be on our platform or at the least if you're big enough or important enough you know it's a simultaneous release Yeah. but if you know Microsoft's Xbox Live Arcade passes on you like uh we're not gonna look at it this time then you get a deal with Playstation Network or Steam and you come out and it's quite popular they don't want that gaming like even though that game's popular and they were wrong to pass on the first time they don't want you coming back what was impressive at the end of it um, was, you know, there's some corporate speak of um, we want what our customers want from us, yada, yada, yada. Um, but he says in here... where Where is it? Because he says something in here about the... Um, uh, if we want to command, if we want to continue to command healthy average selling prices, which we do, that which we offer our customers has to keep getting better. But I mean, basically, what he's saying, like, it, it's so close to saying, it's like, look, games cost sixty dollars a disc because we make them all price it at sixty dollars a disc. Xbox Live Arcade costs fifteen dollars a game. Because we make sure they're all priced at $15 a game. And we make sure that there's not but one or two games released a week. They artificially right. create the scarcity to keep the price high. And I think there's also a perception issue, too. Like if, And I've noticed this with a lot of both on-disc games and XBLA titles that have moved to PlayStation Network, or I guess even to Steam. There's kind of this perception of... Um, well, it's coming out on this other platform, so this other platform is an afterthought. And I can see that they might not want it the other way around. Like, if you go, like, well, finally, you know, Mass Effect or Bioshock or whatever is coming to PlayStation, you're like, oh, Xbox is the, you know, the premier location. They don't want that to be seen the other direction of, like, Oh, well, finally Xbox Correct. is getting... And, and to, you know, to stand back and, and say, you know, with history, that's what worked for them in the 360 generation. I yeah. mean, basically, PlayStation launched with the expectation that we were fucking PlayStation. PlayStation 3 came out, you know, like, hey, we're fucking PlayStation. You know, we're the sequel to the PlayStation 2, motherfuckers. Your Xbox console was a piece of shit. Why do you think people are going to jump on the 360? And that's because Microsoft went around throwing money at developers going, we need exclusives, we need exclusives. Yeah. To the point where it's like... They were also first to market. 
they the were they were up ahead by a year, but and I mean that whole interactivity with other people thing that they got right. Well, the, I mean, there's some of that, but the majority of that doesn't work unless you have a, a, a critical mass audience. Like the the online stuff is is second to the critical mass, and it was just tying up left and right. I mean, for crying out loud, they got you know Final Fantasy releasing yeah. on the Xbox. I had called it three years before they announced it. Yeah. <laughs> we all knew it would happen. Just there were so many people who didn't want to believe that Xbox would get the Final Fantasy. So there's a lot to say for making your platform excuse, oh, yeah. uh, exclusive um, to that. And what I've always said to this is like the danger isn't from Sony here. Like, well, look at the Wii. The Wii is irrelevant at the moment because yeah. they made the Atari 2600 mistake. They're, they're just letting tons of people turn out shovelware for that platform. The whole platform suffers, yeah. you know? But I think the reason you're probably seeing a lot of the indie developer or indie developers leaving these professional studios is because there is so much money involved in, you know, if you're, if you're developing a big name title by a big name publisher, you want it to hit both major platforms you know you want it to be highly polished and you know all this stuff and but the, you know see, there the thing is, is the risk no like, no the thing that, said, that you're missing here is issue. that uh, and the point that i'm trying to make here is that it can unravel on microsoft so quick they won't see it coming because oh, with yeah. steam right an indie developer doesn't need to release a 60 dollar game and any developer doesn't need to have a 21 million dollar budget if right. they can make a quite happy living, you know, on Steam with five exactly. ninety nine games, because the sixty dollar um, games to to maintain that level of of game, you know, you have these huge teams and you have them basically. And what happens out games when the gamers the know that between five and fifteen bucks on Steam is what I buy? You know, it's like you go into Steam, you go to five and fifteen bucks. It's like why would I pay sixty dollars for that game on that shelf? You know, it's it's going to be down valued anyway. I'll just wait. Yeah. I'll pick it up at the GameStop as long as we can do that. And next, yeah, you know, and next year, but, you know, they're going to come out with the sequel. But there is one thing though: it's that there are people playing games on both PC and consoles. But there is a very, very large proportion of gamers that just don't play PC, and to them, Steam just doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. And they, Microsoft knows that. Yeah, yeah. The. Uh... It used to be your sports fanatics, but now it's really become like your Call of Duty, Modern yeah. Warfare guys. Like your first-person shooter have, has Team has Fortress. supplanted the uh, the sports guy as the guy you can count on who's going to buy the latest console and buy the edition of that game every year that it comes out. Um, yeah. And big companies don't want a game unless they can, you know, unless it's a, a whole IP that they can keep churning out games for. Well, and the danger in the console market, um, we've talked about this, isn't that like one day Nintendo or PlayStation are going to wake up and realize, yeah. well, we're losing the race on these rules. Let's just change the rules and let's be the open platform. Let's just let Steam yeah. install a client. Put a Steam client on a PlayStation 3 and that sucker would be insane overnight. You know, but I mean, that takes a whole new mental shift thinking that's not going to happen these country, at these companies. Some other company comes along, you know, like OnLive. OnLive is a good... Well, yeah, exactly, like with the GameStop issue. With GameStop... Um, all right, so the news on that, if you hadn't heard about this... Um, this is just insane. This is, yeah, this is this is crazy, but um, Deus Ex, if you bought the, the retail box version for the PC, inside the retail box version was a coupon... To get the online version for free, I believe. And is online like on live like a, a console, like a box you have to buy? It's or? yes and no. You don't have to buy it. You can buy okay. the box and hook it to your TV, and it's a lot like a Roku. It right. just streams. Okay, so on live is not running on your PC. On live is streaming. I don't believe this technology works because I've been a gamer too long, but apparently it's it's doing quite well. Um, yeah. But I'm sure it downloads and caches basically. Or well, it's like not that. running the game; it's streaming the screen to you. Oh, okay. So it's I using see. video it's streaming running on technology. It's running on a cloud okay. server. You're getting the screen back. Oh. And apparently it works 
better than you think because I don't think it works that well, but apparently it does well. But digital and distribution the thing is that the, to the TV. On Live needs people to try their service right now. Their right. biggest problem is that people think like I think. Like, there's no way I could play uh, a decent game streamed over, like, you know. People that probably don't want to put out the the money for the equipment. Yeah, I know games that have lag issues and performance issues running on my local console on my local TV, let alone trying to run it on the cloud. Uh, but no, you can buy the box and hook the box up to your TV and, and play it like a console. You can also download a web client and just run it on your PC. Right. So, um, and you know, the, identi- the, the advantage is any PC anywhere. You know, like if you can stream video, you've got a gaming rig now. Netflix or Hulu, uh, basically, for yeah. gaming. Yes. And... They need people to try it. So they got, you know, Deus Ex. Like, you already brought the game Deus Ex. So it's like, almost like compare. Like, hey, check out Deus Ex. You've you played it on the PC. Go check it out on live. Realize, like, on live isn't that bad. Yeah. Um, there's some other issues to, you know, to, to I guess it's just really to accept in, in the new world with on live, too. One is, like, buying a game that you don't own a copy of. Yeah. Um, they were going to try, like, some kind of, like, rental model and... They backed out of that whole model and they like well, I mean, kind of replaced it. It kills it, but... things like modding and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, but well, you can't. I you don't know. think you can mod because you don't actually have um, servers and, and such. Right. You know, like you, you you don't have access to the server. To it's mod. not going to replace PC gaming, but it can coexist with PC gaming. Well, well I mean, I but think... it could definitely make a big dent on console gaming. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Well, go sorry. Um, what I think it. It's really good at is for games that necessitate multiplayer. You, you can't really play single player on an MMO, so things like on live are ideal. But when you wouldn't have done... to deal with the lag of the clients. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It would all run on your server. So what they need to do is they need to give people a test. So they put this free coupon in the Deus Ex boxes. GameStop, they started by opening the boxes and taking the coupon out because GameStop is trying like to launch an online gaming service. At the store. Yeah. From what I They had the employees at the store. They sent them all a memo, break open the boxes, take out these coupons. Um, so it's like then they sold you the box and you got the box and it's like there's no coupon in it that you, you know. Uh, I, I guess People you can't really were... say like you paid for it, but like if you bought it anywhere else, that's what you would have got. Um, and they weren't really like stickers on the box saying like, "Hey, we opened this and took this out because we're GameStop is busy launching a competitive online gaming service." Because mm. GameStop basically sees like when the world goes digital, there's no GameStop anymore. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can already... go right now on your PlayStation or Xbox and buy actual disc titles. Yeah, so. and sometimes they're cheaper than what GameStop wants. And GameStop is scummy anyway. I'm like, I don't have a whole lot of love for GameStop. There's been times where I've gone in and I thought I got a really good deal on a game at a GameStop and then, you know, used and then walked into Best Buy and saw the game brand new at the same price. Yeah. And it's like, oh, man. So it's like, I've I've learned my lesson. I've done it a couple times to learn my lesson. Like, if it's not five bucks at the GameStop, I'm not buying it. Yeah. Either it's insanely low or it's $54.99 and just released. Yeah. And And if it just released. Anything in the middle, I will not give my money to Game. If I'm going to play retail, I'm not going to give it to GameStop. Yeah. Um,. So then there was a whole bunch of back and forth and, like, negative press on it. Uh, what's weird is that Ubisoft came out, makers of Deus Ex, and they apologized for not telling GameStop they were in there. So the way they took it was like, no, no, GameStop completely has the right to control what they sell. And, like, we didn't tell them we were putting the coupon in the box. And I thought that was kind of weird. Is that just, like, the passive-aggressive way it to deal with it? It did passive-aggressive way to, like... You know, <laughs> if you, you know... Oh, we're sorry. You're a bunch of jerks. Well, okay, but look at it from from Ubisoft, like because you gotta you gotta do a Sun Tzu art of war, right? You gotta yeah. like step back and like, what do we want to happen? A, we don't want any bad press on us from this. Okay, I mean it's not their fault. B, we want our next game in GameStop store, so we don't want to screw up all the negotiations. Right. So at this point, you just go out with a mea culpa and you you know you fall on your sword and you apologize to GameStop and you take all the blame. Uh, but this in turn is passive aggressive and it How made do you, them like, look worse. Well, did you sorry. see their reaction? Yes, their reaction, GameStop reaction, they pulled Deus Ex now. Yeah, but right now they started uh, handing out uh, sorry emails and giving out 50 bucks to people who had pre-ordered the copy. So they're trying to make up for it. So the passive aggressive stance worked. Oh, and by the way, it's not Ubisoft, it's ADOS. Oh, it's ADOS? Oh. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I was... 
a lot of Assassin's Creed going on in this in this house right now, and so <laughs> like that's used to seeing that logo. Um, yeah, EDOS. Um, so, so wait, wait, who's giving the fifty dollars out? GameStop is now giving fifty dollars gift cards to those that had pre-ordered Deus Ex on PC. Wow. And they still get the game. They're basically eating yep. the cost of the game. Well, on the pre-orders. Yeah. If you came in the store, probably not. But it... Yeah. But... Well, I think if you have a receipt business. and you email, you're, you're fine. But I'm not exactly too sure of how it works. I, I can see that, though, because pre-orders are big business. Because they, they get you at full price, and they get guaranteed money you know, the day the game comes out. I mean, pre-orders... I mean, that's why they go through all the crazy pre-order bonuses. But... Yeah, just it, it's just insane. Like this whole thing is insane, top to bottom, you know. Like on on all counts. Um, fortunately, from everything I've heard, Deus Ex is a really good game. I'm gonna have to uh, uh, get it, although I'll probably wait for it on Steam. Uh, I, I don't know. It depends on whether the achievement whore in me wants achievements or not. <laughs> well, I, I'll definitely get it on Xbox myself, but I'll wait for the price to drop. Uh, yeah. I had read. A very interesting comment in one of the forums regarding that news is that uh, it was a guy that said it's as if every big companies right now are just trying to see how far they can go, how how much they can screw over the consumers and see how they will react. Well, oh, like you know, GameStop, that's... yeah, in relation to GameStop. Well, even the yeah. AAA publishers and everything with you know. It's like Ubisoft stuff. trying really, really extreme stuff with their their uh, DRM and calling it a success to their investors and, and stuff like that. They're really trying to push the limits on how much consumers can be stripped away of their rights. Yeah, I mean, they, they are definitely trying to see how much they get away with. I mean, it, it seems weird that Microsoft would let um, these companies, you know, EA does it, Ubisoft does it, have their own networks inside the game. You know, I mean, so yeah. it's like, I mean, that that's kind of ticks me off. You load up the, you know, EA Bioware game, uh, you know, you Dragon Age 2, you load up Mass Effect 2. You have to you, log you, in. You have to log into the Cerebrus well, you don't network. You have to, but you You have can, to go activate you your EA account, and then that's where you'll get some of the DLC comes from this other account. You know, like the uh, Uplay was... uh, is on uh, the Assassin's Creed games that we got. And, you know, since I'm playing them so late, I'm kind of even wondering, like, is that even worth it? Are those servers even still up? Um, but it seems weird that Microsoft would let them do that because that kind of devalues Xbox Live. It's exactly. like, wait a minute, I'm paying $60 a year for this gold membership. And then if you're going to turn around and let the, uh, the publishers require them to have all my details so that they can market the crap out of me, it's like, what am I paying for? If you're going to add support, it, add support it. And but worse don't, yet, like, try to charge and add support. Yeah, worse yet is like those companies that have their own servers in the network are actually offering a less good service than Xbox is doing. And I'm thinking, you know, the Sega games like Chrome Hounds and everything, they're just pulling out the, the servers and the game just loses its multiplayer. And I mean, the game gets really drastically less relevant in your collection. So it's really like. Am I just renting a game now when I buy it? It just changes everything. I, I kind of agree with you everything, except is, is Chrome Hounds a loss? <laughs> well, well, I don't know. I mean, people bought it, and they bought it to play it. And it, I mean, I've got it. I've got it sitting on the shelf. Um, I can't tell you the last time I put that game in. Yeah, I understand. It's pretty much a question of principle. I, I mean, I understand why they would stop supporting Halo 1, but... When the console is still alive and well, and there are still some people who like the game and want to play it, I I just don't understand why they would stop supporting it. Yeah, and that is that, that is the thing. It's like if it's if it's not on live now, you have to trust Microsoft to keep it up, and you know, Eidos, EA, Ubisoft, exactly. they also have to keep it up as well. And you know, it's just one guy that goes like, hey, we just you know we only have you know twenty thousand people a night playing this game now. It's it's no longer you know our Call of Duty numbers, so go ahead and shut it down. Yeah. Um, Whereas you would assume that Xbox, you know, Microsoft has it's an economy of scale. You know, running a whole bunch of servers for them is probably not. And this is a fear with all the indie games too, because you have to be online to play the indie games. 
So that's probably some, the aspect that frustrates to me. Uh, that frustrates yeah, at me most. some point, right? The, the the 360 is end of life, and all those indie games are gone. Like you're gonna lose access to all of those. It won't even be like an issue of like, oh well, they're digital, and and you know, all my 360s have died, and I can't actually play them on any hardware anymore. Um, it's gonna be like, no, those servers aren't up anymore. It'll be like the Walmart music servers, you know. It's like if you bought <laughs> music off Walmart, Walmart shut down those servers. They're like, yeah, not enough for playing. At least Walmart unlocked all the DRM before they they shut and them ho- down. And hopefully, but... you know, Microsoft would do that before they wishful release. thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's a big, you know, if <laughs> Xbox Live. If they want to kill it completely. They'll be like, yeah, and you die now. <laughs> I guess it depends on how big XBLIG is. It doesn't matter. When. 360 finally hits its end of life. So, um, all right, I, I I think we've we've kicked that horse a bunch, uh, and it, and it's quite dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's let's move into the new releases for the week. Uh, this week was the 19th of August through the 25th of August. Uh, first one on the list. Oh, this is also the first week of the Summer Uprising, so I'll try to remember yes. to call out uh, uh, when it's an Uprising game. First one on our list is Torque Quest, and um, we we did do video of this. Um, oh, let's I, talk about the game before. Okay, we get into the let's video. talk about the game before we we discuss what happened on the video. It's kind of this bizarre, quirky point and click adventure. Yeah, it's wanting to be a a, a scum type yeah. game, but it's interesting. I found the jokes a little bit not laugh out loud, but at least a little internal chuckle. Yeah, yeah. it it, it might have some humor, but I, I yeah, it was walls of text to get through, and most of it is works. not written well. It's very strange. I I wonder, considering that there's the the language option at the beginning, if like. A lot of this stuff is translated, and there's something you know. I don't missing think, there. I don't, I don't think know. so. You had the USA flag, and then you had a almost Spain flag for Spanish. <laughs> almost Spain. <laughs> it flag. didn't have the little thing in the middle with the eagle. Are you sure it was Spain? I thought that was Germany. That was like the black, no, yellow, it was and red, yellow, red. Was it red, Germany yellow? Is... Red? Germany's black is red, yellow, and black. Red, yellow, and black. That's what I thought the flag was up in this game. This is a, a I'm country staring at the of database. Hold on. Ob- <laughs> or origin. It's English and Spanish. No, okay. Okay. Uh, I'm staring at the database page for it. Like I, I could just look. Uh... But no, what happened in this game is so it's got this little like mode, uh, interrogation mode, and uh, it's it's kind of it's, it's like a mo- gimmick. Vaguely reminds me of the Oblivion. Uh, I think it was Oblivion where you could. I don't know that, that game. I didn't play. Yeah, so. like you could talk to someone and you could do different things to improve or, or damage your react your. your well, I mean that's approval. all you do. So this is a mode yeah. where all you do is try to get through this interrogation. And I, I think I just hit like the uh, surrender or whatever, like on the third. Maybe one, you're getting like, interrogated. I didn't pay that much attention. Yeah, that's what you are. You're being interrogated, because... and um, it says like something stupid, like "Hey, this is a trial, so we're not going to tell you anything in the trial." Um, and then it goes into an infinite loop of buy screens. You cannot exit, and it cannot time out. It 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 no, it didn't seem like it would hit the timeout because we went past eight minutes. Um, I, I don't know that we actually did because I went to go certain. into early, so I can't say I for think certain. We were, uh... we were close. Um, I mean, we'll have to go back. I'm not going to say for certain on the podcast we were beyond eight minutes, but um, you can't bring up the guide screen. And like, if it would go back and play one frame of the game, the buy now screen uh, popped up. You were trapped in that. We had to shut down the Xbox to get out of it. I'm sure we that don't wasn't know intentional. how this past peer review stigs. No, we have no freaking clue. Only that this there we, will be video of it. Though. I mean, I don't know if this is something because of the simulate flag. Like if this is something that could have gone through peer review and it wouldn't have had that behavior. I wonder if they just didn't test it. Well, like, who would test the cancel of the buy now screen? Exactly. Over like, and over, you know, like, like it's, you know, of course, 
They'll usually what you it. test and and the usual fail condition is you 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 hit buy and the game doesn't switch over into publish purchase mode it still has like some oh the buy now screen is still up even though i just bought the game in the in the simulate uh trial mode but yeah i think this is a this is a horrible this is a report and pull in my Stags opinion eggs always checks it apparently um <laughs> well you know none of the reviewers uh except stags are stags unfortunately <laughs> Um, Unfortunately, or thank the world. Depends. <laughs> depends on if you're still a dollar game or not. One half of the other. Uh, Doc Logic is our next game up, and not I, like it's basically a side scroller. But they have this um, mechanic where you have to you have to hit collect checkpoints to ex- extend your time limit. You have to kill enemy. You have to power up. There's there's a whole system of powering up and how you want to use a shield. Which to... I didn't know until after I died. Oh, that there was a shield or that there was a system of power ups. Any of that. There's no no introductory screen really of that. Okay. So yeah, this actually I think was I, I didn't hit any tutorial whatsoever. I mean, maybe there was a menu screen or something. I missed I remember for there reading was a, this. A, like there's a help. There's screen. a help screen before you get into the game. If you go into the game thinking, oh, there's going to be a tutorial, nope. I don't, okay, yes, yeah, so I don't <laughs> but, remember anything. But, I mean, I kind of figured that stuff out. I mean, I mashed the buttons. So you're, and... Yeah, you're fighting against your your time, and you're also trying to level up so that you can open up new areas of the stage, which what you get is a lot of doubling back on yourself. Yeah, so that's, that's the thing. You're, like, playing the same level over and over again. And and your character's leveling up to actually go into different areas. Um, so basically you just kind of run around and collect like five time pieces and then that gets you to the next level, quote unquote, um, to, to go on. The, Unlock new area. The um, mechanics, though, were way too loose. They and were, you couldn't see the top but... of the screen. Yes, and there were times where you actually had to get up. You had to get up there. Yeah. I don't think the mechanics were that bad. They were a little loose. I think this would have worked if it was an actual, you know, platformer instead of, you know, where you had to go back and forth instead in the of this same weird, area. Not quite a puzzle, but yeah. yeah. When, the, when the guys got on screen that started shooting too, though, I, that was just too yeah. much. Even with the shield and the loose controls, though, that was, that was too much to, to try to get. True. Especially if you were trying to get like a watch piece that was up on the top clipped off at the top and yet there was two things firing in between it and yeah and unless you were powered up you couldn't fire so yeah you know you would actually have to go in and melee them uh our next one up is a tank a tank tank a tank like attack and a tank. tank yeah um nothing much great about this at all uh horrible tank controls well, I mean, you're controlling each tread. Yeah, you can directly. control each tread, which is not fun at all. And it's kind of weird because you can strafe or you can move forward, so you. It's not immediately clear, and it just gets really tough. Um, it's a neat and, idea. And you know, it's supposed to have this little like ASCII art style. Yeah. Um, that that's great on a web page or you know a phone and JavaScript. Not on my 360. Not 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 swayed by the ASCII art style on my 360. Yeah. Um, next one is our first game this week that is part of the Indie Uprising, the Summer Uprising, and it is Raventhorn. Um, very beautiful game. It's Thor, but we were probably afraid for legal reasons to call it Thor. Dude's got a hammer, but we gave him a sword just so, you know, uh... He's not Thor anymore. He's not Thor anymore. Thor's slightly younger brother. Yeah. Uh, it's Asgard and... The Ragnarok and, and all that. Yeah, Helheim. all, all north. So, all right, here's my complaint on this game because it looks pretty. Yes. But, uh, like Miss USA, that's about all it's got going for it. <laughs> and it, uh, it has this combat mechanic of stamina, right? Yes. So, when you go in there, it, you want to play this like a combo button masher. That's what it sets it up for. That's the graphic style, that's the feel of the game. The problem is if you press that button too many times, you're out of stamina. And by too many times, I mean like five. 
Yeah, and and it takes like twenty stabs to kill something. Yeah, when you start up, you fight one monster at a time, but they're all really, really powerful. I think there's some rhythm there that we weren't getting, and I may be wrong about that. Maybe you are supposed to sit there, block, and and just wait. Which, if but that's it, it, like if it's this block and wait game, that's not a lot of fun. Like, yeah, you no, know, I agree. Again, it feels like a button masher. It feels like it should be a combo button masher. Uh, with the graphic and the art style that they've definitely achieved. But the... Ah, I don't know the but, mechanics of, like... I don't want to sit around and wait for a meter to fill up in my games. I also wonder if that improves as you level up. And once... If spells become more of an issue. Like, if you get mana faster, then spells could become more useful and... But yeah, they're almost they kind of like one-shot things. Like, hey, yeah. I'll use my one spell on the level here. And then, like, three fights down the road, I'll have another spell queued up. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, it, it, it suffers from serious pacing problems, but it looks pretty. Uh, next game up, uh, quote-unquote new release, Cursed Loot. Uh, this is, and it, I mean, it's not trying to hide it. It's on the box art, basically, that this is uh, Epic game, Dungeon re-released as uh, Cursed Loot. I think it's a re-release, basically, from the product of some legal issues, which I can speculate, but I don't have any hard, fast yeah. reason. But they incorporated, I'm guessing at that point, when I Hook Games Incorporated... An attorney said trademark it, and then something come up about trying to trademark Epic Dungeon. So they either said, that like, or there's either the lawyer like just said, like, hey, we advise you not to, you know, just just get a different name, just avoid it altogether, or like, you know, Epic uh, Engine. It's all speculation, though. We don't know what the true case is. The real tragedy is that um, you can't rename a game on Xbox Live Indie Games. Yeah. So I mean, so it pretty it much has, has to, to be taken down and re-released, and that means all the updates and things they added. Don't go to the people who bought the original game. Yep. And to be fair, it does... I, I did a review of the first one. And, and it was a buy. a buy. They do... They have added a couple of things. There seems to be... Like, there's a new class which focuses on the regeneration ability that was there in the Got first this. game. There's um, a couple of different skills, like perception and things like that. And I don't know exactly what they do from the trial, but it seems like, you know, there's more passive abilities going on. I think perception made your lantern a little bit more effective. Yeah, which I, I guess would be good because that was kind of the you always had to go buy more. So I mean, it, it's it's a new release this week as Cursed Loot, but it was a buy before and it's a, and it's a buy right. now. It's, it's not a like buy now. They've added to it. Um, yeah. It's just a little awkward in like the circumstance. And yeah. you know, If you haven't played on. Epic uh, Dungeon before, definitely check it out. Um, and it's still, you know, it's still a dollar. So if you really liked Epic Dungeon and you want sure. more of it, there, there's a significant amount more added to it, which I think eases the, you know, second release bit, right. you know, because I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of games that get caught in list freezes or something that would love to be able to change their title and re release again. Um, but at least knowing that there's more content somewhat placates that. Uh, next game up is Attack of the Evil Androids, and they actually used the little uh, the Google worlds. Android oh. logo guy. In the really, game. you didn't Did notice, not notice that? that? You didn't notice the little androids with these little trash it can? Didn't armed? register for me. I mean, I just uh, saw robots and didn't think about it. All robots look alike to you, don't they, Dylan? <laughs> yes, I guess so. <laughs> you well, robotist. they hit it very. What? I said you're a robotist. It's <laughs> like racist for robots. They hit it very well. I'm sure, you know... Yeah. Well, the bigger problem with this game was the controls. Yeah. Like, this is the hardest to control ball I have ever played in my life. Like, this thing... Like, this thing made That's Marble Madness do. look smooth. I'm not sure why you're playing a smiley face either, but... No, I there. don't know that. It, you um, know, smiley face that can launch bombs and missiles. missiles. Yeah, and... It was just really difficult. It was too easy to get... To take damage, like if you're going fast and you ran into a wall, yeah, you you, you could launch yourself, you get rolling really fast. I mean, the biggest problem, like when I say bad controls, was literally like trying to make a jump up a step. Yes, like that could get insanely frustrating, far much for than it should have been. You yes, know, because you had like this 
the double jump, but the double jump seemed like weird or broken. There was some like timing to it. Like if you did it quickly, it boosted, but if you did it like apart, then like the second jump really wouldn't jump that much, you know. Um, it, it's almost like maybe there was a physics engine that wasn't taking into account like a like if you were falling and then you you did the, your second jump for a double it was jump. Still applying the it falling. was applying the downward force or something. Well, no, they actually. Um, I think this is one of the things they mentioned in the tutorial is you hold down the A button to jump farther. So I wonder if it was like you were jumping the same amount. It was just somehow the way it was structured. I don't know. Um, as we can we consider this deep lull of the games this week, Steel Avenger, which is a clone of Spy Hunter mm-hmm. and not that good of one no. at all. Uh, imagine Spy Hunter with a bunch more cars on the screen and play at about quarter speed. Yeah. Well, now, there is a gear shift. You can move faster or slower, but the, the number of cars oh, on the screen... Oh, I had the gear screen, shift maxed out. It did not go as fast as Spy Hunter. I it didn't come close. could not max it out because of the number of cars on the screen. Like, you were going to hit something. There was no way around it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it was... It, it, it's a bad Spy Hunter, and we'll yeah. leave it at that. Meep 2, Jumping Evolved. I think I now understand I'm supposed to call these Doodle Jump clones. I think that's the... See, I don't have an iOS device, so I, I'm not familiar with Doodle Jump, but I guess that's kind of the iconic genre-defining... It's a force jumper instead of a It's a vertical scroller. jumping game. It's a jump vert. It's a vert jumper. Um, um, yeah, so you, you jump up uh, platforms and you, you get to the top and then you do it again. Um, Mega Jump is the one I have. It's the 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 song's cute. The little song says meep 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 meep. Uh, next one up is Lucky Game. We're we're hitting. It's gonna get better, folks. Stick with us. Lucky Game is a combination between golf and slot machines. Yes. So you like it's it's like a pinball launching mechanic. You, 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 if this game was not on Prices Right, it should have been. Yeah, it could have been. Uh, I don't remember it on Prices Right. I used to watch a lot of Prices Right. I did too. It, it just it has that feel. Like basically, there are three holes, and you shoot your golf ball, and whichever hole it lands in, you get a different slot machine, which is fixed. There's no like completely timing. random. Yeah, with a different probability and a different payout. You lose a hundred points or a thousand points per shot. So basically, like I ended up yeah, and you can losing very easily. Like the shots aren't that easy no. to dial in, and you can very easily lose like several chances not even hitting the um, uh, slot machine. You know, hitting yeah. the right bound to go down to the slot machine. Um, next up is Heroes versus Zombies. Earlier in the show, I talked about crappy first person. Or crappy uh, dual stick shooters of like this is the first game I made. It's a dual stick shooter that does nothing else. Uh, that was this. That was this. <laughs> Actually, I played the first level. I, I think it was going towards a. Um... I got to like a little boss fight and it. Did you try going into the store? Yes. Okay. For some reason, it like aired out when oh, I did. Okay. And I'm did like, you do that? I got into the store. Done. Um, I bought an upgraded gun. And then subsequently, like immediately, ran out of ammo on that gun and had to go back to the uh, old one. So is it trying? I upgraded a couple of times, and I was like, "Yeah, this is stupid," because you can't tell the difference between the kind of fast zombies and the really fast zombies. (laughs) Kind of fast and really fast. Yeah. So they're all fast, basically. Like, well, there's no, there's kind of fast, really fast, and the ones that are turtles are slow. Okay. So. Was it trying to be a tower defense light? Is that no? Was, there was no okay. tower defensey about it. Like I didn't have anything okay. to place. I didn't get into the store. No, like no, I the said. store was just upgrading okay. you uh, okay, so and it's... abilities for you. Uh, our next game up is After Dusk. We did video of this one, and this is um, it's it's a two D platformer that's kind of in the vein of like or, or the setting is in the vein of, like, a dead space or a system shot yeah. of, like, ooh, creepy derelict spaceship. Um, but the spaceship actually turns out to be overrun with zombies, so it's... Something, yeah. 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 Um, Something where they mutated an actual human first. 
it's kind of an 8-bit style game. It doesn't have, it doesn't come off as cleanly as a lot of uh, retro games do. Really, there were just a lot of polish issues. Like, when you went to save your game, it, it took, took forever. forever. Ever. It's a neat concept. I'd like to see, like, another game from the same studio, but it felt it, very rough. It is a neat game idea. Um, it, the controls need some work, um, and, you know, the level design actually does need a little bit of work. But it, it's it's overall it's worth a look because that's why we did a trial on it. You know we thought like yeah. this is this is worth a look. Uh, it's got some neat ideas going on, so you may want to give that one, you know, check it out. It, it has some ideas going on. The next one um, up is Video Wars. We really wanted to play this multiplayer on the trial, but uh, the trial only allowed uh, single player. Yeah. But it's kind of a in between Risk and Tower Defense. Yeah, because you kind of like take over territory risk style on this on the board that you grid out, but then you place um, bunkers and you place um, different. Uh, what, what did they call the the, the units? units? Turrets. They were just units. Nodes. They were just called units. And like then you could build turrets. No, no, no nodes. That's what it nodes is. were your bases. Nodes were the bases. So you place the nodes, and then from the nodes you could crank out units, which were flying units, which would go to the other side and take out their nodes. Um, and you needed nodes up to control a sphere of influence. It, yeah. It's it's interesting. I mean, yes. I could see myself playing it. it. When you get into it and you kind of understand it, um, I, I can see my place. But it's a minimalistic tower defense. What What's really difficult is they've got a build menu, and it's separate from, like, the but You know, your A, B, X, and Y do certain things normally, and then you hold right trigger to get into the build menu. And it was a little confusing for me how that worked like i kept building units but didn't realize that i actually had to hit a again to, to deploy them, them and to get them to fly the out menu. yeah yeah i um, just kind of did it by accident the so, first time you know play the tutorial a couple of times and yeah it's a really fun game so next one we have up is a summer uprising game uh it is tec 3001 and um this is a Impossible game style force scrolling platformer, only that you're scrolling in 3D, so you're running into the screen. Uh, I, I think you liked it better than than I did. I kind yeah. of found the controls to be looser than I wanted. Uh, for us, it was really easy just to send your guy off almost at a right angle, and yeah. it's like given that the game never really demands that much of a turn, I felt like it should have scaled like that better strafed instead of turn basically. yeah maybe a little strafing but maybe like you know all the way over isn't like a right angle turn all the way over it's like a 15 degree adjustment because yeah. you never really need to make more than that i thought the the 3d is really polished you know you you're basically running down um i would say a lane but it's actually like roads that can branch off and come back together and, and actually have you know height and depth um, and you have to pick up so many batteries before you exit the level. Like, really simple concept. I think they take that sort of force scroller, and we, we played a 3D avatar version. It's it's a lot looser, but I feel like it's it's a lot less constrained. It's not like, oh, I'm running down this road, and, you know, I'm Yeah, locked. you do have a lot more freedom yeah. of movement, um... Than, than some of the other games in this in this style in this you genre. You kind of do neat tricks and stuff. Like yeah. when you actually jump between roads, then it starts getting interesting. You can, and the, and the roads are alternate paths, and so you know you kind of there, there's a little bit of like need to play this through once just to even know what my choices are going to yes. be because they're coming at you so fast. You know, as especially you see in get, the video. As you see in the video, when you pick up the ultimate power speed, um, that's probably not worth it in most cases. Yeah, I mean you have to know what's coming. Our uh, next one up is Space Bat. This is the other game that made me wonder how it got released, given how yes. much trademark material is in this game. Um, I, I do kind of think, like, this might be pulled at some point. Yes. It's got Pac-Man in it. It's got um, uh, the Space Invaders in it. You know, and these are the actual space invaders. They make the space invaders sound. Pac-Man makes the Pac-Man dying sound. Like, um, 
you know, I, I'm okay with like the little nod every now and then, but I'm like, man, you guys, you used all the invaders from Space Invaders for your invaders. I think the only thing they think is that they're going to be too small for them to be come after. Yeah. Again, Epic Dungeon had to become cursed loot. Don't think you're that small. You're still on the Xbox. There is a legal issue. The the interesting thing about this game, it, it didn't play too bad. Like, when we played it in the video, you know, there, there is definitely... It relies heavily on power-ups. It It's difficult without certain power-ups, yes. and, and there's kind of that random factor to it. But I just got to wonder if a bunch of guys sat around and, like, and I ironically thought we should combine all the elements of these games. You know, this would be the greatest Which, thing okay, ever. Okay, so that's what the gameplay is. Like the gameplay is breakout, but you have Pac-Man as the ball and the Space Invaders as the bricks, and they're going back and forth. Well, you have and bricks listen. and Space there Invaders. There are bricks yeah. sometimes as well. So you you, you knock those out, um, and then the weird thing is like Pac-Man can turn himself ninety degrees midair. Like, if he gets close enough to an invader... I did not notice Yeah, that. if he gets close to an invader, he'll turn to, like, eat it, or the invader will touch him or something. And then he, oh, like, ricochets, sure? like... It's weird. It's it's weird to see. You, you, but you can notice it because there's, like, a line going back. But when the invaders start dropping missiles, like, in the third or so stage, yeah, it just gets way too busy on the screen, and if you don't have, the like, novelty wears off fast. Yeah, if, the one thing I liked was that it showed patterns in the in the... I'll call it sand, for lack of a better word, of the big um, monster in the background of what had happened, explosions and trails of of uh, crossfire. I didn't even notice that. Like I just I didn't even. You only register. notice it if you're watching and not playing, because it's too eh while you're playing <laughs> to actually notice that. Yeah, I wonder if these people did it unironically, or if it's just like. Let's just throw this crap together, and it'll be crazy. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what the story is on that one. Our next one up is a, a Summer Uprising game. It is Cute Things Dying Violently. And this, uh, well, first of all, I was disappointed to find out that cute things are really just circles. Um, to They're me, more I was looking for some puppies and, and kittens and squirrels, you know, like cute things to die violently, not circles, but... They make little cute noises, I guess. They have cute sayings. Um, and it's kind of a puzzle. Kind of a platform puzzler. And you basically launch these guys to get them to the exit. And you may have to have them land on a switch to get something to clear so that you can get to that exit. Um, and just avoid, like, saw blades and spikes and things. Uh, it looks... It looks okay, I guess, if you want that. It would definitely be a much better uh, touch game. It would be a much definitely. better phone, uh, iPad game than it isn't a 360 game. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the violence is amusing, but puzzle on thumbsticks is kind of difficult. Our next one up is Blobs. And Blobs is a match three game. The thing that it does differently is that the... Stuff, the the lines come down from the top and they're kind of like slowly marching and you got to quickly match them before they get all the way down to the bottom. Yeah, uh, they block you in. They can actually touch the bottom. Um, you're basically pulling one block off and then shooting it back somewhere else. Yes, and that's the other thing. You do pull a block off and then rearrange it. Um, I actually got into it. I did mean, you? Yeah, I mean, I probably wouldn't buy it but i actually like playing the trial i actually got into it you lost those eight minutes you were just like gone for eight minutes absorbed in the game no, not really i mean it took 550 what 550 430 you were lost for four minutes and 30 seconds no i i, I don't know how long i was long. i think i did actually play it until the trial came trial screen came screen came up um i don't know it's pretty fun you the controls took some getting used to. Um, just the the way you swapped between columns felt. Uh, our next awful. game is Ambient Travels. App. It's it's a photo viewing app. I don't even know what the buying it gets you. All the rest of the pictures. All the rest yeah, of the like, pictures. 
Okay. You, you can get, get more than picture. Ireland and uh, okay. what was the other place? Yes. Philippines. So I have all of the damn pictures now uh, because this is another piece of shit <laughs> game that just like, oh, you hit this button, I'm going to pop up the nag buy now screen. And I was on the couch when I was playing these games uh, with my daughter who had my had the laptop and she was going through learning Python, learning programming. Uh, and I was kind of looking over there and I just wanted to exit. I was hitting B to get out and exit, and then I look up, and the screen says, like, you know, uh, your download is in progress. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I want my goddamn dollar back, all right? That's, oh. that's what I want there. Speaking of that, our next game up is a silver dollars game. Yes. It is the Jump Hero. And I know what you're about to say if you've listened to this podcast before, but... This is different. This this is a different type of silver dollar game. Now, you still have the stock video, stock art worked into the game. Like a little like as a little reminder every now and then, like the, the the voice or or the dancing girl in the background of like, you know, the generic stock clip art that, you know, is used of just to remind you you're playing a silver dollar game. I, th- I think I said on the video, you can take the game out of silver dollars, but you can't take silver dollars out, out of the, the game. game. Uh, we have this really good game. Uh, it needs a flashing girl. Dude, yeah. dude, yes. Dude, dude. We need a flashing girl. Put her in the background. I'm not going to let this clip art collection go to waste. No, why did you do Stock that? Stock photography will not go unused. It's it's basically you know one of these impossible game for scrollers. Really well done. So, so uh, it takes a different tack. It actually, you know, for, for as much as we're knocking it, or I'm, I'm knocking it here, um, it takes a different tact. And instead of being really punishing, it's really forgiving. Yes. You know, it's, it's like, hey, I'm gonna going to You're going for high scores. You're going for high score. I'm going to give you lives all the freaking time. Um, so you can just do that. You, you die, you pick up immediately from where you left off, and you, and you keep going. Uh, the controls have... So you have your jump and your double jump, but you have wings that you can throw out too that will let you glide back down, and you can jump, glide, and then use your second jump, which is really good when you get in touch with it. You'll see me in the video with this um, for getting yourself out of missed jumps. I mean, that works yeah. really well. It, it's kind of interesting. Now, I heard, I read online some of the reviews. It does not include uh, an online leaderboard. And I guess if you really are into that, like you said, it's it's like a high score type game. No peer to peer, or even any kind of leaderboard, really hurts um, this type of game. Yeah, but still one of the best um, four scrollers I've seen. Not that and I like four scrollers. Props for the name. Props I really the like name. the name, the Jump Hero. That's that's excellent. I, I'd say that coming. for What's once. That? For once, Silver Dollar Games did something actually worth their time. So I don't know if we should just ignore the title for all the crap they've put up on XBig, or if we should buy the game just to to tell them this is what you should do. Don't don't stop doing that, please. <laughs> Vote with your wallet, basically. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Knowing Silver Dollar Games, like this is just encouragement for the rest of their stuff. Yeah. Like they're gonna throw whatever they want up anyway. Um. I think I think we've already said that we have a philosophical difference with them over the nature of of game game design. Yeah, what qualifies as a game, and I don't think we will ever bridge that gap. And then plus the games that they've released that have been self aware. Don't buy. Why did I buy this? You know, like they released the game. Why did they buy this? They're fully well aware of their reputation and what they do. So. It's they just what they it. do to tide it over between yeah, they the, know the, the games like this. Uh, next games. one up this week is Doom and Destiny. Um, so this is a JRPG. Yes. And this looks like it's going to be quite an involved JRPG. This involved looks pretty large. The, yeah. the town that you start in is at least not a, a nine-box gri- nine grid. Yeah. Yeah. It's... Um, What's interesting is this was built with RPG Maker, and I don't know if there's a new RPG Maker product that actually supports XNA, or if these people built like an exporter. Um, but you know what you get is a lot of really good art 
<clears throat> a lot of really good effects. Um, you know, it, it feels like, you know, your Final Fantasy 2, II, Final Fantasy 3 style game, which... Yeah, for me, uh, it's, like it's Dragon top. Warrior. Um, well, yeah. That Dragon was my Warrior. kind of, my introduction to JRPGs. And that also probably explains a lot about why I don't want to play any JRPGs. <laughs> I don't know. I like Dragon Warrior. Did it you? Didn't have the I liked it. Dragon Warrior on the NES? Yes. One and two. I never played anything beyond that. I think I played a bit. I never played anything played beyond the first eight, hour. I played and I think I played most of seven. Well, I mean, well. again, that that's like Final Fantasy where it becomes a t- complete, like, there's a there's a line where it I becomes a different I lit one game. of my brother's eight, and I don't remember getting it back. Yeah. But my first... Is... Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. My first JRPG was Final Fantasy one. And when I tried that game, it was like maybe four or five years old. I didn't speak English back then and didn't know how to read. And I was just fascinated that the idea that a few click of a button meant that the character was doing the action for me. Uh, and I know that a lot of people are really like having bad opinions of JRPG in general and think that they're not mainstream or whatever. But I've seen the same fascination in the eyes of someone that was five years old, that didn't speak English, and who just saw my DS Final Fantasy III and really got fixated with the game and wanted to try it because he saw me just press a few buttons and then see spells and special effects or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it, it really... I think the where you come down on JRPGs or, or not, it probably has a lot to do with like what your initial impressions were my initial rpgs were the ultima series yeah so like that shaped a lot of the idea of what like i think of as a good rpg is what ultima did which was all you know it was action oriented and and um there was, wasn't menus were for dialogue you know um they they weren't part of gameplay yeah. so when when i played dragon warrior then i was kind of like ah why this is slow i don't want to wait this is your NES, SNES generation RPG, which for me was where I came in. And... But definitely, you know, take a look yes. at Doom and Destiny. And we got definitely. a video on that one coming out. Our last game this week is Cubicle. Um, fuck this game, I lasted like 60 seconds. <laughs> like, this this isn't a Silver Dollars game. Uh, it's not even at not that level of quality. Not enough pictures of women. Yeah, it's not um, even at the level of quality for a Silver Dollar game. It's... At least the silver dollar games, when you press the buttons they tell you to press, it works exactly how yeah, they want you to. That, the, the weird thing is, basically, like you have to hit... You're at a desk, you have a stack of papers, you have to do quarter circle left to pull certain papers over to... St- and then, like, And you have to staple push them. up and down to staple, but it doesn't always yes. register that you did up and down. Yeah, I tried that once, and that was it. Done with the game. Again... <laughs> This feels like a bunch of WarioWare mini games, and, and it's like you know, that's except ex- over an extended. How many period times of time. you come home and like, I want to collate, load up that collation game for me so I can you know, get my cover sheets in order. Well, I mean, I, I never really have to sign anything or stamp anything at work, so that's a different experience. Maybe yeah, like maybe if you're a software developer, uh, maybe you want to do some mindless uh, desk work. Maybe no. all right. That wraps up our uh, new games for the week. Let's see here. Um, I would add something. Yes. Okay. Uh, Battle High San Bruno had a very nice update to their game, and it's not a new game, but it's really worth checking out. Yeah, we that's we right. have that. Uh, uh, Battle High was a buy on our site. I yes, I believe yeah. so. Yeah, that was a. So that you know, I'm not. Uh, I look at some of those games, and I'm like, I don't think the Uprising. Personally, for me, the Uprising should not have taken released games even yeah, with updates, updates. Yeah. battle sam burn sam burno battle high 2 totally you know like get that in there um even if it's not a crazy departure from one you know um but yeah um it's good that they are doing updates though like i mean this benefits people who've already bought it I mean, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's good that the game's you know, getting updated. It's if you want to highlight that another way. Yeah, highlighting that in, in like, another new game could have been featured for that slot. Yeah. Not big on that. Well, but uh, it it was already out, so I think that's all the one. Is that all the one so far um, for the Indie Uprising? TEC, 3001, um, what was the other Cute one? Cute Things, Dialing Cute Violently, things. Battle High... So far as I know, I've I've not been keeping up with the updates. So okay, 
But uh, we will have more Uprising games next week. So, uh, running back down the list here, we did video on Doom and Destiny, Jump Hero, Cute Things, um, TEC 3001, Video Wars, After Dusk. Uh, do any of the others really matter? Raventhorn, wow. Doc Logic, yeah. So, on those, any early Game of the Week feelings? Um, I would say Doom and Destiny just because it hits that nostalgic sweet spot for me. I've done this before with games, so you can completely disregard this nomination. I don't know. So, are are you Jump Hero? Is that in your running? Is that... That's that's probably one of the higher ones in my running. Shoot things dialing violently. I like that one, but yeah, that's because I like games like that. It's it, yeah, it's kind of a puzzle game. So that's I where did. Although I do wish the cute things were cuter. I did like Video Wars, but that was just kind of a. I wanted to stab it yeah. in the face. It was just kind of <laughs> a again. A, you have to spend a time micromanagement enjoyment. You know, like that kind of hit that nerve. But it wasn't a as bit. pain. The micromanagement, at least. In the the demo wasn't as, but painful. I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe surprise here, and say like for the game of the week, like if I'm gonna sit back and be objective, like my vote would probably go towards Doom and Destiny, simply because like even though I'm not a JRPG fan, what yeah. I played of it, that thing is a full on huge huge RPG. You're gonna it feels like you know the start of it, the size of the yeah. map, where you went around the first town, like. You're going to be playing that game a while. You're going to get um, your three dollars out of that. It's going now to be insane. Now that I think about it, that may be an uprising game. I don't know. If, it may not have gotten voted in, but I remember seeing that on the. I'll be honest. I, I don't. I get remember the, the feeling list. that um, a lot of the games that were submitted for the uprising held off to release the week of the uprising. Yeah. Which you mm-hmm. can't really blame them. I mean, if you're going to say like, "Hey, we're going to advertise this week," um, now. Had you had you realized how dead the weeks prior were going to be, it was Might really a, easy to you know. It depends, but there's going to be more eyes on. Yeah. The... So I would I would also say Doom and Destiny. Cicely, where are you at? I will go with the JRPG. You go with the JRPG. <laughs> All right, so that makes uh, Doom and Destiny Game Arc's Game of the Week. Uh, congratulations to those developers. Let's see who's the developer on that. That is. Heartbit Interactive. All right. So have they done anything before? I don't remember. The That's not a name that pops up. Uh, yeah. No, I would be immediately. No, I don't have anything in the database from there. Like when I, I googled um, something, like I, 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 the I, actually I think it was RPG Maker. I'm surprised that if RPG Maker supports this, I'm surprised we don't see more like this hitting, um, you know, hitting the marketplace. So, all right. Well, that uh, that kind of wraps up the the show. Anything you want to plug uh, before we get out of here? Yep. There is one thing. Um, I don't know if there are a lot of viewers, but Nine Dot Studio has a mission, and it's to make conditions for game developers better. So, if there is anyone who wants to support that mission, I'm very open to have your like on Facebook and share the word because, well. I really need every little thing to help me out. Okay. All right. There you go. Uh, we'll, we will definitely get the Facebook, and uh, we had it in the, 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 the news story for this, but, I mean, it'll definitely be in the show notes as well. But it's just 9 dot studio uh, on Facebook, and it's 9.studio.com uh, for the web address. Yep. So you can go there, fan, follow, like, um, you know, stick together, and... Really looking forward to getting to play Brand. That looks like yep. that, uh, that that's going to be good. Cool. All right. So uh, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And everybody, we will be back in a week. Have a nice night. <laughs>